Have you ever found yourself in a bit of a dither when it comes to getting better photo engravings on Slate? Now, I know I certainly did, so I've done a heap more testing since the first video, and I want to share with you exactly what I've discovered to help me understand what's going on with my photo engravings. G'day and welcome to Mr. Craftsmith. I'm Darren, and I'm hoping you'll stick around for a bit to learn what it takes to get better results. Now, towards the end of the video, I do a side-by-side -side comparison with the different tests so you can make your own call what you think works best. Okay, let's jump into it. Now, image preparation is going to be the key to getting the results that you want. So I'll be working at Adobe Photoshop and Lightburn. Now, if you don't have those programs, that's okay. Whatever image editing program you use, you should have similar tools to achieve the same outcome. Now, a quick tip before we get started, it's always beneficial if you're starting with a higher resolution image with good lighting on your subject. Now, while I know that's not always possible, it doesn't hurt to consider those if you're taking the images yourself. Now, let's jump into Photoshop and learn how to process our images to create a dither image ready for the laser. So we're going to take this image here of this black dog, Urban, and uh, I call it Urban the Wonder Dog because we got we had an amazing session with Urban down on one of our local beaches here on the Sunshine Coast, an absolutely beautiful spot. And this is the same image, if you haven't watched it already, the same image that I used for photo engraving on wood, which wasn't terribly successful. But what we're going to do is we're going to convert this file to a dither image, which is what we actually require when we're working in Lightburn with images to uh, produce a, um, an output on the diad laser. And a dither image is simply just a series of dots that uh, will make up this image and we'll, we'll see that as we run through it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert the image size to the final output size that I'm going to be wanting. And we're going to be working here with the um, millimeters. And so we're going to be going at 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters. And that's going to be at 254 uh, pixels per inch because that's the first test that we're going to be doing. And in this case, I'm just doing a bicubic sharper which is for reduction. So as it comes down in size, it's actually going to be a little bit sharper. And you will notice there that there is a, a slight degradation in quality because we have resized that. And now we're just looking at that at 237% uh, uh, resolution. So um, that's why you noticed it might be a little bit softer. In order to create a dither image, I need to be able to convert this image to a grayscale. And so up under the um, image mode, I can select grayscale. And it's going to ask me here, discard color information, which is what we're actually wanting it to do, because it's got to be grayscale to create a bitmap, uh, which then we can, we can create a dither from that bitmap. Now, the other thing I need to do as part of the creation process, if I go back up to image and I go to mode, you can see that bitmap is still grayed out. And that's because bitmaps only work in 8 bits per channel, whereas currently this was a TIFF file, so it was at 16 bits per channel and just basically has more color information. So I'm just going to convert that one to 8 bit per channel. And now if I go up under image mode again, you can now see that I've got this bitmap available to me. So if we have a look at that one, and again, I'm just going to follow the prompts and flatten the layers. And in this instance, we're going to be outputting it at 254 pixels per inch. And the method that we're using is diffusion dither. Now, there's a couple of different ones here. And uh, diffusion dither seems to give the uh, best outcome. And it's more of a random type sort of dither that uh, follows an algorithm, of, of course. But uh, if I just click on that one and hit OK, you can see that as I zoom in on that one you can just see the individual dots and so in this case when we're working in light burn the dots that we want to uh, that that represent a fire of the laser is going to be the black dots so if we jump in here we can see there at the moment that uh, all these little black dots represent uh, essentially representing a pixel and there's 254 of those per inch because we're working on slate i need to invert this image so uh, at the moment if i was printing on a white background this is exactly how it we would we would want it however in order to print on slate we need to invert now in photoshop it is super simple to invert an image 
and it's just a command prompt. And so I hold down command and I for invert. And then that's as simple as it is. I've got my inverted image and we can go out and save that file and get that ready for lasering. Before we jump in and have a look at these uh, engravings, I just wanted to quickly show you what I've been using to uh, get the images that you're about to see. And um, that's what we're looking at here is a loop. And that's what we're seeing on the right hand side. Now a loop is essentially a fancy magnifying glass, I guess. And uh, you put your eye right up to that one, or in this case, I put the camera right up to it on my phone. And what we're seeing on the right hand is the field of view. So each one of these numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that represents millimetres. So each gradation uh, within there is 0.1 of a millimetre. So it's quite a fine uh, tool to be sort of looking at these images. It's not something I'd necessarily recommend getting, but it's certainly been able to uh, demonstrate um, some interesting outcomes from these engravings that we're seeing. So let's look up a, a close-up look of a dither pattern under the, uh, the loop. And each one of these white specks essentially represents the firing of the laser. And, um, you know, so this is, if we look at those, we can see quite clearly that, that they're not round at all. They're more, like, more shaped like a grain of rice. And um, so this one is at 26% power. And we can see over here, uh, it's giving us a good white sort of a look. I figured that the size of the laser fire could have been refined a little bit more to um, have a, uh, a smaller dot. So let's have a look at that one. And dropping it down to 17% power. Now, even though I've got the scale wrong on these ones, but we've got the, the uh, scale in there to sort of give you an indication. But... These are the same length as the 26% power. So you can see that they are, in fact, much narrower on the, uh, on the vertical uh, distance there. So, um, but we're still losing our resolution on the horizontal. So the, these are sort of sitting just under 0.1 uh, of a millimeter on the vertical, but on the horizontal, you know, they're, they're definitely uh, twice as long as they are wide. So I think that's... Part of the problem that uh, we, we can encounter when using a diode laser for image engraving, particularly using these dither patterns. And uh, this will demonstrate that quite clearly. So this is a, the dither test that, uh, a new dither test that I've created. And uh, that we're starting at the zero brightness value, which is our blacks. And yes, you can see that there's no dots on there, so it's an accurate representation. And then we're going through the brightness levels of 13, 26, all the way through to 255. Now, I do have to disregard some of these results, the 191, 204, 217, round about there, because I only established this after I'd done the engraving, that this side of the coaster was about 1.5 millimetres uh, shorter than the right-hand side. So it was probably a bad tile for me to try and do this uh, test on. But anyway, and that's why I'm sort of, once we get to the next point, you'll see that I'm dis just disregarding those values there. But if we take a look at a close-up of the, um, the 178 brightness value and the 217 brightness value. Now, I, I can say that, yes, the, this 217 looks more complete but that's only because we're looking at it up close. Uh, but the 178, beyond the 178, there was no real discernible difference if we're just looking at uh, face value. Uh, and you can see, and I think this is where we start to lose that resolution in the horizontal because the, uh, the, the laser firing is, is more like a grain of rice. So we're not getting, and it's twice as long as it is wide, so I think that's where we're starting to lose some of that resolution and the potential um, output for uh, those white values. So in this instance, I used a white value, um, an output white value of 180 brightness. And so that's what I've used in one of the tests that we've done here. But this is a, it's, a, it's just a handy little test. It's, you know, yes, it's, it's just essentially showing us what the limitations are of our diode laser or CO2 laser, if you're using this file for CO2 lasers, that um, it's just giving us the limitations on, on a dither pattern and, and what's actually discernibly different uh, at either end of the spectrum, depending on the substrate that we're using. 
So let's jump into the images, and this is the first one that I did, 3,500 millimeters per minute, 26% power, 254 lines per image. And the image was converted to a dither pattern in uh, Adobe Photoshop, like I showed earlier in the video. And I, I can see there that this, um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. And, and bear in mind that these slate coasters are a, a, um, 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters or four inches by four inches. So what if you're looking at this on a bigger screen, then obviously these are going to be represented much larger than they actually are. So, uh, But I wanted to sort of show that so we could have a look at that dither pattern and uh, the level of detail that we're actually getting. So as we established, we could get a smaller dot size essentially by reducing that power. So we reduced the power to 17%. Everything else was the same, 3,500 millimeters per minute, 254 lines per inch, and using the same image conversion method. And definitely uh, we can see that we've got an increase in resolution and uh, it's introduced a couple of these extra lines, these horizontal lines, which is not uncommon to see because we are adjusting you know, we're looking at the vertical resolution there, I guess, uh, that we we do have little gaps uh, in between the lines. So from that perspective, I knew that I could increase my lines per inch. So we did exactly that, and we upped that to 300 lines per inch. And uh, same pr uh, conversion process, but this time I did uh, re redo it to 300 lines per inch as a dither as well. So it just matched the size of the image that I was going to be engraving and a much better output. Um, maybe not as bright, but that's not necessarily the point of the exercise. So we can get that higher resolution, even though the uh, diode laser is shooting that uh, rice-shaped um, beam of light, essentially, but um, which is gonna impact our horizontal uh, resolution, in, in my opinion. Okay, so the next image here we have um, it was suggested to me that why don't you just use Lightburn to uh, create the dither image. And I did do some testing on this with some of the uh, image modes, which was Jarvis and Stucky and, and a couple of others, and I wasn't terribly impressed with it. But um, an expert in the field suggested I just try the dither. And uh, so that's what we've done here is I've converted the image to uh, inverted the image in Photoshop and then brought that directly into Lightburn and just applied the um, dither pattern to it. And it gave me this result here, which was pretty good. Now we'll say that Photoshop uses, we use the diffusion uh, dither process or algorithm. Uh, in Lightburn, they use the Floyd Steinberg uh, dither algorithm. So it is slightly different. And we'll see that difference when we do a side-by-side -side comparison shortly. Now, this was the, f the, the last one that I, that I tested. Lots of testing. And uh, like I said, if, you, if you're getting value from this, but consider giving us the thumbs up on it just to know that I'm on the right track. But this uh, image was converted to dither in Photoshop. Um, but also I adjusted the output white point value that we established that we were sort of losing that resolution beyond 180 um, at the white end of the um, scale. So uh, I did adjust that. And it may not be uh, obviously apparent here, but uh, just holding it in the hand, it does seem to have more uh, detail retained, uh, particularly within the, um, the sand dunes essentially and, the, and the, the beach and the sky. So let's have a look at those all side by side. And from my mind, the ones that we really need to be focusing on is the bottom line here. Um, if, if you have a preference, you know, maybe just pop that down in the comments. I'd be interested to see what your preference was. Um, it, again, it is difficult to because you're not holding them in your hand, but uh, this gives you a fairly good representation of the final output. Now, to my mind, the, um, you can see here the light burn dither. Uh, does vary slightly to the um, Photoshop dither, and I think it gave, um, to my mind, it wasn't as aesthetically pleasing as the Photoshop dither. The Photoshop dither seems a little bit more random, uh, and this seemed a little bit more pattern oriented, even though it's supposed to be a uh, like a random pattern. But it just seemed to be 
that uh, yeah, to my mind, the, the the number three was the um, the standout for me, along with number five, although not necessarily apparent here. But if we take a look at the closer look at those two side by side, um, the the dot size on these or the detail is um, it's marginal, I, I guess at best. So I guess that highlights the point that if you have a, a great image to start with, and you process it directly in whether it be in Photoshop or in, in Lightburn uh, for the dither pattern, you're going to get pretty good results. So the one on the right is where we've adjusted the output levels of the uh, white point and dropped those down. And I do believe that there is a little bit more detail in this, in this uh, engraving. But it's going to be subjective and it's going to be dependent on the type of image that you're processing. Now, the focus of this image was a black dog, whereas if it was a white dog, I would definitely be considering the limitations of the, uh, the top-end brightness values uh, because that's going to impact the image significantly. So that would be something that I would just be suggesting. But if it's, you know, it, in this case it's a black dog, I think you could definitely get away without adjusting that output level of the white, um, the white point. But um, again, that's image dependent and something for you guys to have a think about when you're processing the image itself. So how did you go with all that? I know it was a lot to process again, but uh, you should have a much better understanding what's going on with your own laser. Now, if, you can, if you've got that magnifying glass or a, uh, you know, a loop or something like that, that you can take a closer look, have a look at the shape of, the, um, of the, how the laser is firing in yours. Let me know in the comments below what, uh, what yours is doing and let me know what you think is the best outcome. But for me, I personally like the uh, being able to produce that dither directly in Photoshop. It's a, it's a program that I'm uh, re really familiar with and being able to do that myself, uh, I, I know with confidence that I'm gonna get the results that I'm looking for. So until the next video, make sure that you stay creative and be grateful. Bye for now.